a treat this evening. So by Horizons Camlog are proud to present and partner with Dr. Robert Stanley, who you may also know as globally acclaimed Smile Engineer. Dr. Stanley is joining us live from the US this evening to reveal the truth about dental implants, deciphering the implant design for optimal results. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about Dr. Stanley's background, which will give you all an insight into his experience and how that's applied to his work today. So Dr. Robert Stanley's professional career began as a mechanical and aerospace engineer, where he achieved a PhD in engineering. After working a decade in telecommunications, he returned to school to pursue his passion of dentistry, earning his dental degree from the University of North Carolina. As a dentist and an engineer, Dr. Robert Stanley has the unique ability to master and share his understanding of biomechanics as it applies to the daily implementation of dental implants. He has extensive experience in implant surgery, as well as advanced bone and soft tissue grafting. And due to his uncommon depth of knowledge, Dr. Stanley is frequently called upon to consult with dental industry manufacturers suppliers and laboratories on product process creation and improvement. He's a lifelong learner and enjoys sharing his passion for engineering and dentistry as the co-founder and education instructor at the Stanley Institute in North Carolina. Additionally, he works as a professor in the Department of Prosthodontics at the Chapel Hill School of Dentistry, also in North Carolina, and he's involved with numerous professional societies and organizations within the US. I've had the pleasure of working with him for over the past few months to not only bring this webinar to you all this evening, but also to announce that he will be coming to the UK in May, where he'll teach an exclusive two day masterclass with hands on workshops on the four cornerstones to implant success. At the end of this webinar, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. So please enter your questions into the chat box during the webinar and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. So with his uplifting energy and wealth of knowledge, I'm delighted to welcome and hand over to the one and only Dr. Robert Stanley. Good evening, everyone. I am in the process of sharing my screen. So give me one second here. Okay, the continuity camera is not coming on. Is it still locked? Okay, so that's good. One second, folks. We're... Looks good, Dr. Stanley. It doesn't look good on your side. Okay, good, fine. Yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and start then. All right, you should see the title slide, yes? We're all yep. good. That's it, perfect. Okay. Wonderful, then we'll get started. So tonight's lecture, uh, uh, actually the primer here, is about dental implant design. And I want to start off with an old video game from back when, when I was a teenager called Tetris. And when I was at the university, I remember learning certain pieces of information. And it dawned on me one day that knowledge is somewhat like the game of Tetris. So you have individual squares that represent data. Those data can be clumped together into small elements called information. Then they can be stacked together and we would call that knowledge. And when you get an entire row that comes together with the last missing piece, there's this enlightenment where you get wisdom. And my objective in the short time we're together here tonight is to take you on a short journey and perhaps provide a few squares that will give you wisdom. So let's start with functions. And when I say functions, I don't mean complicated functions like we learned in college, but I mean really simple functions like this. This function, if read out loud in terms of like normal English, would be y is a function of x. In real layman's terms, you might say, the temperature of your house is a function of the thermostatic setting. But everyone knows that the temperature of your house is a function of more than one variable. In fact, you could say the temperature of my house is a function of 
the thermostatic setting, and if I have any open doors. And if you have any children and you live in an environment where it's cold in the winter, you know it doesn't take very long at all for that door to be left open for you to realize the door is open. Why is that important? Because in engineering, we do something called an optimization problem. So in this example, we would ask ourselves the following question. Which of the two parameters, the thermostatic setting or having the door open, has a more impactful change on the temperature of the house? And everyone here would clearly say, well, the door being open makes a very dramatic change very quickly. It might take an hour for the thermostat to reach its set point after such an event. So you'd say the, the, the parameter here that has the most impact would be the door being open. Now, why did we start with that? Because we're all here to talk about this, which is implant success. So I ran this analysis in my brain a few years ago, and I said, implant success is a function of what? And I started to make a list. So I want you to think for just a moment as I'm talking about things that you think are important for implant success. And some of the obvious ones will come straight to mind, like the health history of the patient, uh, whether or not they've had uh, past periodontal disease, the quality of the bone, the volume of the bone, the age of the patient, any medications there. And so you start to make a list. And what I've done is I've taken the opportunity to compile a short list for you, and here they are. This is a short list of 51 criteria that all have been identified as participating in the success of any given such implant. Now, the question is, is if we run that same optimization problem that we did on the house temperature on this, we don't have a very good answer, do we? In other words, if I said out of all of these parameters, which one has the biggest impact on your patient's success with dental implants, what might it be? And it's a question that we tackle with the four corners of implantology because I've spent a significant amount of time thinking about all of those parameters and I've come to this theory. There are four main things that if you get these right, you'll have an extremely successful implant practice and your patients will have form and function with their tooth replacement options and you will be very happy and they will be very happy, which is what at the end of the day we all want. Now tonight, we don't have a lot of time together, so we're going to focus on this, which is the second most important thing, which is implant design. When you get all four of these together, you can do cases like this. So here we have a patient, and they are getting ready to lose the tooth in the 2-1 position. I'm sorry, it was labeled number nine for American terms. So what we're going to do is we get them numb. We atraumatically remove the tooth that's got the external resorption. We use a type four surgical guide. We go through the sequence of drilling the hole. Then we pick up the implant. We drive the implant through the guide to a desired uh, depth position that's identified. We gap graft the gap between the implant and the buccal labial walls. We place the Stanley anti-rotation wing provisional that was prefabricated in place, torque it, cut the wings off, cover the access hole with some PTFE, and then make adjustments on occlusion so they're out of occlusion. In an under 10 minutes, you have a case that looks like this. This is what the patient reported back one week later. And the 2-1 position is the tooth that we replaced. And you can imagine, what we've done here is we've maintained the bone, we've maintained the soft tissue, and as this patient heals going downstream, when they come back in three months, making this a final restoration that is just beautiful, that blends in with nature, is very easy to do. Now, I don't want you to think that anything in that video was hard because it wasn't. In fact, I say that the method maketh the man, not the man. And what I mean by that is there there was nothing in that video that required extensive hand skills or, or some sort of gift from the artist's gods. It was very, very straightforward. And that's what we learned in the Cornerstones. And it all starts with tonight and implant design.
So I go by the name of the Smile Engineer because I have three engineering degrees and, and then I went to dental school. And hopefully I haven't lost you already by talking about functions up front, but I believe this firmly. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Quick disclosure, all of the cases are mine. None of the images have been manipulated unless it's clearly obvious that they've been manipulated. I did receive a small honorarium. I co-founded the Stanley Institute and I invented Brightgums. A quick aside, if you're the type of person that would like slides, you don't have to record this or take uh, screenshots or anything. I will be happy to send you the PDF of all the slides that are shown tonight. Simply send an email to info at stanleyinstitute.com and just put in the subject matter UK slides and I will send that right away to you. So let's get started with implant design. Now you may be wondering this, all implants work. And if you've practiced for any sort of period of time, surely you've come across someone who's said this to you if you haven't said it yourself. And I often wondered, why do people say this? Why do they say all implants work? Just pick the cheapest one and, and get going with it. Well, let's look at this. Patient reports, uh, new patient reports, you pull back the lip on the first exam in the 2-2 position, you see this. You see that the, the crown isn't on the occlusal table and you see a little bit of erythema around the margin. And you ask the patient, hey, what's going on here? And she says, yeah, I had an implant placed there 24 years ago. I say, does it hurt? She goes, no. Has it always been red? Yes. Has it changed? No. And you look at the implant and it looks like this. And you say to yourself, well, now isn't that interesting? Because this implant doesn't look anything like our modern day implants, right? Then you have this case. In the 1-1 one -one position, same scenario. The gingival zenith heights on the 1-1 one -one and the 2-1 are not concomitant. The incisal edges are not concomitant. And clearly this tooth in the 1-1 in the one -one position is ankylosed because it's again an implant that was placed 14 years ago smooth wall no rough texture no torque on insertion there's this is a press fit so they didn't have any torque and yet it integrated and it healed reasonably well how about this case it's a blade implant case that i happen to come across at its terminal end of life and you go wow look at that 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 is just amazing right you know all the infection on the lower this woman has had these in for over 30 years. She's 80 at the time of this radiograph. She smokes a pack of smokes a day for 30 years. The top came out. I was able to acquire these pictures of the top and the bottom, even though it was infected, she said, leave it alone. It doesn't hurt me, leave it alone. And she kept the bottom. So you say to yourself, well, clearly all implants work if these press fit and blade implants have all worked in the past. But then you pose this question, why do implants look different today? Well, I think the answer is very simple. Perhaps in the past, the implant success rate was 96%. And with a new modern day implant, maybe it's 99%. And at first blush, you might say, well, that's only a 3% difference. But the difference could be a three-fold difference. Let me explain. Let's say in my practice, I have one failure a month. In your practice, you have three failures a month, almost a failure every week. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I had a failure every week with dental implants, I would probably be very concerned about my implant practice. That isn't a very productive way and it doesn't make you feel good about yourself at the end of the day. So is implant design important? So let's go to the literature. Now, if we look to the literature, it's been clearly stated for many years that the surgical success rate from insertion to uncovery is usually 98% or higher. And it says, regardless of implant design or, or size. So in a two-stage approach where we bury an implant, let it heal and come back and uncover it, that first three months during the healing phase is very, very predictable. But then in, in uh, 2015, the Journal of American Dental Association published this article, which was the top 20 adverse dental events. And what was interesting to me when I read this article was that 53% of all complications, of all complications in your office are related to implants in some form or fashion. Now that in itself is pretty remarkable, but what's even more remarkable is the second item on the list came in at 5% denture adhesive. So there was a huge drop off in terms of complications. And what this is telling me clearly is that if you don't want any complications in your office, 
either you need to stop doing implants or we need to get better at doing implants. Now, something that's very of, uh, of interest to me is the following slide that says this. Overall, patients experience 3.8 times more prosthodontic events than biologic events. Now, the reason why it's kind of interesting to me is that most of the conferences that we go to will be a two-day conference on periimplantitis, right? They spend their entire time focusing on periimplantitis, but we're four times more likely to have prosthodontic complications in our office than periimplantitis. So you would think that we would be spending a lot more time talking about things like we're talking about tonight in order to drive these failure points down. What are prosthodontic complications? Screw loosening, cementation breakage, abutment screw breakage, abutment breakage, prosthodontic failure, implant fracture. I've scaled the font on the left to be four times bigger than the font on the right, which is the biological considerations, which they exist they exist and 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 make no mistake a mechanical complication i.e if the implant fixture fractures becomes a biological complication right so it can lead to a biological complication but this failure right here on these two implants that failed is predominantly based on implant design so this implant has a as a design fault that we go over extensively in the two day course coming up in may as well as this one. This one failed at insertion. So the picture on the right, which was taken through a microscope, shows the fracture. And the interesting thing is the doctor that placed this could not immediately back this out of the hole because the top of the implant was um, flexing and the driver was just snap, snap, snap loose inside it. So they ended up having to trefine this out of the hole, which created quite a defect in the bone. And then Facebook, uh, I love the post to Facebook and social media. Everybody is so witty nowadays. Uh, in 2017, last week, today, this implant has a design problem. This implant has a design problem. So if we go back to this statement that surgical success is 98%, what happens once we uncover the implant? Well, it's pretty obvious that two things happen. One, we change the biology and two, we change the biomechanics of the situation. What we end up doing is we start to use the implant for what it was intended to be used for. So let's consider the biomechanical considerations. To start this story, we have to start with bone. And we all know about Mish's, Carl Misch's bone densification classification system. D1 is hard bone, D4 is soft bone, and we know there's different regions in the mouth. And that's not necessarily what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on is this. If we normalize bone and we say bone is as strong as it can be in compression. In other words, bone loves to be given a big, nice, warm hug. It's 100% in compression. It's 30% weaker in tension. But remarkably, it's 65% weaker in shear. Now, shear is when two forces are opposed and the, and the object between it is in the middle. So it's pushing... Uh, on the top one way, on the bottom the other way. That would be a shear load. So as a general principle, if we're designing an implant, we want to make sure that the implant to the bone interface minimizes shear. That would be a reasonable engineering expectation. So let's talk about implant design. In implant design, I've broken it down to eight main categories that every clinician should be aware of the high level criteria associated with these with these eight categories. Tonight, we're gonna to talk just briefly about a few of them to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of plugging the knowledge gaps. So the first one is material, and we start with the story of cyclic fatigue. So how do you break an endodontic file? Well, you bend it, right? If you take an endodontic file and you test it by putting in a jig like this, and then you rotate it, as it's rotated, it's actually bending back and forth, it's flexing back and forth until it snaps when I mean, it snaps in half. So how do you break a coat hanger? Anyone who's old enough to remember, we used to use coat hangers to get into our locked car. So we would bend a coat hanger back and forth, break it in half, put a little bend in it, slide it over the window and pull the latch up. Well, you bend it, right? How do you break a dental implant? Well, that's right. Here's the ISO test that every manufacturer has to do. And what they're doing is they're bending the implant 
under this test until it breaks. They're applying a sinusoidal load, and what they do is they tabulate that. So here's a lovely plot of four major manufacturers' test results. What you have on the bottom is the number of times that the implant was cycled. What you have on the, on the left-hand side is the amount of force that was applied to the implant. So if we assume a 35-pound force was applied, what we see here is that whenever the line started on the left-hand side crosses below the horizontal green dotted line, the implant has failed. So the dark blue company didn't even get to 400,000 cycles and had already failed. The light blue company, as well as the red company, they both cross below the dotted green line at 600,000 cycles. What that means is the implants, those two companies, when those implants were bent 600,000 times, they both broke. The orange company has gone all the way out to 5 million and has not fallen below the dotted green line. Now, why is that important? because we don't know how many times our patient is going to bite on their dental implant, do we? And unless, the, unless you know the patient's getting ready to die or you're getting ready to retire and move to another country where they can't find you, you may wanna choose an implant that's designed to last to 5 million as a factor of safety. In fact, in engineering, we have this common uh, understanding that fatigue failure accounts for 90% of failures. 90% of mechanical failures. Fatigue failure is cyclic fatigue. It's usage failure. If you use something over and over again, it has a tendency to break. So now let's go to the table. And here's a table comparing different types of titanium. And what's important here is that if we look in the strength comparison and we normalize grade 23 titanium, which is on the far right in orange, that's medical grade 23 titanium. And we say this alloy is 100%. What are the ratios to the other metals? Well, it, the purple column is commercial grade four, okay? It's grade four titanium. And it's nearly 36%, well, it is 36% weaker, nearly 40%. Now, sometimes I have a hard time getting that through people's minds when they say well, it's nearly 40% weaker. But let's say you wanted to buy some new golf clubs and you saw on the internet there were two that looked identical but they weren't priced the same. And the reason they weren't priced the same is one on the one side was authentic and the other on the other side was a replica. And the authentic one was made out of titanium alloy and the replica was made out of grade four. And then you borrow Tiger Woods and you say, Tiger, will you hit with the, with the authentic one? And he hits the ball 300 yards. And then you say, will you swing with the replica? And he hits the ball 214 yards. Now, why is this important? Because Tiger Woods is Tiger Woods. And at 300 yards, he's playing in the in, in, in the big leagues, right? At 214, he's not even making the high school team, okay? So this is a big deal. Having an extra roughly 40% strength in your implant can really come in handy and, and, and prevent failures from happening. Now, many of, the rep, uh, many of the implant companies that make implants out of the softer metal have come back and say, well, the softer metal is more biocompatible. So I did a little research and I dug a little deeper and basically what they said was, that's not necessarily true. It says here that grade, uh, commercially pure titanium grades, as well as the medical grade, demonstrated similar osteointegration and biomechanical anchorage. So I think that that might be more of a, of a, a marketing ploy than it is a science ploy. Now, who's using medical grade 23 titanium? Everyone in orthopedics. So if you get a hip or a joint or a shoulder replaced, you're going to be getting medical grade 23 titanium. They're not gonna mess around with a less expensive metal in a joint where it's difficult to get to. And I don't think we should in dental implants either. Why? Dental implants are not designed to be bent. We cover that. When you bend an implant, it has a tendency to break or its components break. When you have an implant that's not placed underneath the crown, you get this cantilever. The bigger the yellow arm, the worse the cantilever. And when I say worse, what I mean by that is it creates a bending moment colored in magenta. That bending moment is bending your implant. It's bending your crown. It's bending your prosthodontic screw. And then you get this in your hand. You go, 
what is that? Well, that's one of those little tiny blue screws that holds your crown on. And when you zoom in on it, what you can see here is that I had to take an instrument and drill this out because it broke in half. So this is supposed to be one screw. And I had to drill a little tiny hole on the top of that to back it out of the, out of the implant. I did that using this screw retrieval kit. It looks rather ominous, but honestly, all you have to do is use these two products up here. Uh, one is a drill and one is an easy out tool. And we use these all the time in mechanics and in the garage. And basically what you would do is you would cut off the, the rusted bolt, drill a hole in the center, and then put your easy out in there, which engages in a counterclockwise direction and it backs your broken screw out. So we have that for implants and here's, here's an example. On the right-hand side, you see the blue screw that's all mangled on the threads. On the left-hand side, the silverish area there on the left, well, that's the easy out tool that I use to back it out of the prostheses. So you see these all the time, but more than just breakage of the screws, you can see this. Now, this is a weak implant with a design fault that's built into it, and it broke at year seven. When something breaks at year seven, clinically, typically we tell the patient what? We say, uh, Mrs. Smith, what did you have for supper last night? Because clearly it made it seven years minus a day. You must have done something to it. It's not my fault. But in actuality, this is 100% of design fault. These two implants were placed in the anterior. They were loaded under a Bruxer for seven years. And every night he bit into it with his lower teeth, including the lingual side of the upper, bending the prosthesis until such time as it fractured in half. This is what it looked like. If we zoom in on it, what you can see is what? Well, you see the bone, right? This wasn't a biological failure. The implant fractured in half. This is a mechanical failure, not biologic. Here's the other half. It broke right in half where this implant has its design, where it has its design fault. So that's our quick and dirty recovery of materials. Let's go on to threads, which I love. There's a series of different types of threads. We're all kind of common, uh, familiar with most of these. The one on the far left would be a V thread. Moving from the left to right, you have a square thread, a buttress thread, and a reverse buttress thread. So a number of years ago, a study was done to show what are the shear forces on the thread face comparing a V thread to a horizontal thread. And when you take it and you break it down and you look at it like this, what you find is this. The shear force on the V-thread on the left-hand side is 10 times greater than the shear force on the right. And remember, we said shear is the enemy of a dental implant. We said shear to a bone to implant shear, it's 65% weaker in shear. So we said, wow, we, we don't want shear but a V-thread is very common in dental implants. What's going on here? Well, the reason why V-threads are common is they're self-tapping. The square thread doesn't cut through the bone well, does it? So with the square thread, which gives you better compression, you'd actually have to do another step in the implant placement, which is pick up a tap, a bone tap, tap the hole, and then place the implant in the hole afterwards, which most people don't want to do. It requires too much effort and work, and they're like, I don't want to do that. So they go with the V-thread. Now, what if we could have a party? What if we could get a V-thread together with a square thread and a nice bottle of wine, and they had a baby? And we called the baby a buttress thread. But then we turn the baby upside down, and we get a reverse buttress thread. Now, what we have is on the bottom of the threads and the reverse buttress thread, it's flat, which is good because that's going to put the bone in compression. And on the edge, it has a taper, which allows us to be self-tapping. Sounds like a pretty good compromise, right? So here we have an arrow. Everyone knows an arrow goes into the target. And when you try to pull the arrow out, the barbs on the arrowhead keep it from coming out. So that puts the, the, the barbs put the, the material of the target in compression and they get hooked. So what if we were going to use this concept to build out a dental implant? And we built a bunch of barbs together. And then what we did is we bring in the bone and then we push down on this implant like we would with a tooth. Well, you see that the underside of the barbs are gonna put the bone in compression, which we said was bone loves. loves bone loves to be hugged. It loves to be in compression. So in this case, we have a, a really good implant design. This is a reverse buttress. And this, con this company right here did that. They put a reverse buttress on their implant. 
Now, what if we were to turn this over? And the first thing I want to ask you is that this looks like an arrowhead to me. So when I push down on this, it's designed to go into the target. And what that, and the reason it goes into the target is that all along the edges of the threads, you see the danger, the little red arrows. Those are putting the threads to the bone interface in shear. Okay. So clearly no one would want to design an implant where the slope was on the bottom and the flat was on the top, except they did. So here's a company, a major manufacturer of implants that put the flat on the top and the slope on the bottom. And you go, well, well, how is that even possible, Dr. Stanley? And well, it comes from this. If you tried to pull the implant on the right out, it wouldn't come out. It's literally like a giant arrowhead, right? You can't get it out. When you try to pull it out, it puts the bone in compression because now the flat is pushing into the bone. Well, who needs to do that? Our orthopedic colleagues need to do that. When they put in a fixation bar, they put in screws with the intent of not having it come out. They don't load it like we do in dentistry. And what's going on is this. We have companies that move into the dental space and they repurpose their engineers that have been making screws for bone for a long time. And they do this. Well, that's the screw that we use for bone, for bone anchorage for years. And the flat is on the top. The flat is not on the bottom. So they get the, they get the thread pattern wrong and they enter the market. Now, if you were to place one of these implants where the thread is upside down, what you'll find is it gives you the most warm and fuzzy feeling at implant placement. Why? Because the screw that you're putting in the hole is going to get sucked right into the bone like nobody's business because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to go in. But the problem is this, guys. After it's done healing, we don't load it like that. When we load it through occlusion, through mastication, we load it with compression. And so for the long-term stability, this may be a concern. The next thing we want to talk about is spiral lock. So spiral lock was invented by Stanley Fassner Company. That's a shameless plug for NASA because NASA launches big things into space. And when they do, they vibrate. And when they vibrate, they have a tendency to, to make the screws become loose. So what these guys did is they said, okay, um, what can we do to a standard thread when we place it? The stress distribution um, between the thread and the implant is like this, where the first thread carries a lot of the load. What if we designed it like this so that all of the little mushrooms are about the same size and they share the load? Well, that's what they did with Spiralock, and it has a balanced stress distribution. Now, why is that important? Well, imagine you have two teams and they're doing a tug of war. The team on the right, everybody's pulling basically the equal amount. The team on the left, the last person on the, on the, on the far left is checking email. They're checking Instagram. They're not paying attention. They're hardly pulling. But the person at the front with the ponytail, she's pulling really, really hard. Now, which of these teams do you think might win? That's right. The team that's pulling equally is probably going to outlast the team on the left because what's going to happen is the girl at the front's going to get tired and she's going to wear out. And when that girl wears out, all of that stress that's on the first thread moves to the second thread. And then from the second thread to the third thread. And then eventually you have screw loosening. So Spiralock virtually eliminates that. Who uses it? Everyone in aerospace, NASA, Boeing, Lockheed, Martin, all of them. Everyone in orthopedics, Smith, Nephew, Medtronic, Stryker, they all use this. And this, this particular design is been implemented in the BioHorizons implant for their abutment screw. And this is why you rarely see a BioHorizons abutment screw becoming loose unless you've done something wrong. So that's threads, which brings us to platform. When we look at the platform, we look at the implant connection. So the top of the fixture is called the platform. In engineering, we had this thing called fracture resistance. Fracture resistance is a function of the diameter of the object that you're bending, okay? Now, it's very easy to understand this. If you imagine you have a small branch, it's easier to break a small branch than, than a big branch, right? Uh, what is of interest here is that it's an exponential acceleration with regards to the radius. So on the bottom, you see we have implant radius. Every time the radius gets bigger, the fracture resistance on the left goes up dramatically. It's exponential. In fact, this is a key take-home point. A six millimeter implant is twice the strength of a four millimeter implant. Wow, 
right? That's pretty amazing, right? This is math. It's not up for discussion. It's math, okay? If you place a four millimeter implant, because that's all you have in your inventory, in a location that qualified for a, for a six millimeter implant, like a lower first molar, you are doubling your risk. You are literally doubling your risk because that implant is half as strong. So you want to make sure that you put the right size in. Perhaps some of you are old enough to remember this show. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. No, Will Robinson. Danger. So lost in space, back from when I was a child, the robot used to always identify when there's a problem. So what we're saying here is danger, 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 doctor. Use the right size implant. Size the implant appropriately. Maximize the size without compromising the volume of bone. It's a nice optimization problem that we'll cover when we come in May. But you've got to make sure that you maximize that size and don't leave it, don't leave money on the table. Now imagine that you have a swing in the backyard, and on one side on the left, you have small branch, and on the right hand side, you have a big branch. And just for a second, pretend like you love your children. And if you do love your children, perhaps you would hang the branch on the big one or the swing on the big one, right? You wouldn't want to hang it on the small branch because small branches break. Now, why are we why are we talking about this? Because it's not only just the implant size that matters. It's also the abutment that matters. So here's a new product that came to market, two different companies. The company on the right has different size abutments. So as the implant gets larger, the abutment gets larger, okay? The company on the left decided to do something that was very clever. What they decided to do is have one abutment that covers all sizes. Now, admittedly, this is a huge advantage for us as clinicians, right? You don't have to say, get me the medium size abutment or the large abutment. You just say, get me the abutment and the abutment shows up and it fits all of the, all of the implants. But the problem is what? Here's the problem. You have a 3.5 millimeter implant and let's say that goes in a lateral position. So the force is on a lateral pretty small and a 3.5 should do just fine in that location. Now, where do you place a six millimeter implant? Well, you don't place it in a lateral, do you? You place a six millimeter implant in a molar. So in a molar position, you've got a nice, big, beefy implant, six millimeters, that's great. And coming out of it, you have a 3.5 millimeter neck. You have a very tiny neck in the first molar position, which has the highest occlusal forces in the mouth. Well, this just doesn't make sense from an engineering perspective to take on all that unnecessary risk just for the convenience of inventory management. So in my practice, I will choose to pick an implant company that allows me to give the patient a solution that's more predictable long-term. By the way, this kind of failure will not happen right away. This will happen at year two or three. In fact, maybe you're searching your database in your mind and thinking, you know, I did have that case that failed at two at year three or year four. Those cases are fatigue failure. OK, they're fatigue failure. And if you go back and look and say, did I build any cantilevers into that solution that over time might have been bending that skinny neck abutment that caused it to fail? And so you start to become a forensic dentist when you do things like that. So I'm not interested in the product on the left, even though I love the concept of making it convenient for me because everybody wants a more convenient workflow. But I think there's too much risk associated with that to pass that risk on to my patients. And that, it, like I said, after a number of years, dentists aren't owning that responsibility. We're not saying, you know what, that looks like fatigue failure. Um, I'm going to retrieve the implant, look at it on the microscope, look at the grain patterns and verify that it's fatigue failure and give you a, a, a refund. We just don't do that. We just blame the patient. So what we're looking for is kind of this. The implant on the left looks like a heart and we love the heart. So what you have here is you have a nice, fat, thick heart, which is covering the emergence profile and it's less likely to break. On the implant in the middle, you have what we call an ET. To me, it looks like the, the, the old movie, the ET has a skinny neck and, and a crown on the top. So the one in the middle is, with that skinny neck poses a potential problem of breakage, not initially, but over time. And the one on the right is very interesting because it has not been restored. This dentist placed this on social media and they were very happy with themselves. They were very proud that they got the implant to stick in the bone. And I think that the, the, the ship has sailed on 
success being measured as did the implant stay at the time of surgery. Um, this implant, hopefully you can see readily, is woefully undersized in diameter. It is about four millimeters too shallow from its depth. It is about two to three millimeters too distal from its mesial distal distance. So what this is giving you is it's giving you right off the bat, a skinny branch that's likely gonna break with a giant cantilever. So the chances of this actually making it past um, a couple, actually making it to three years is really low. In fact, I suspect that this will probably break within a year and a half to two years of placement. And, and in this case, it's likely because of that implant design that the implant itself will fracture. And when implants fracture, clearly that's a bigger problem than an abutment screw fracture because you can retrieve those, but implants, you have to take the whole implant out. And as we mentioned earlier, that becomes a, a big problem for folks, right? So implant location is important as well. So we've covered just a couple of these high level concepts and hopefully I've filled a, a few gaps for you in terms of knowledge plugs here and there with respect to everything uh, in our two day course that's coming up in May that we will cover all of these concepts and more. So we will cover the four cornerstones of implant success. Today, we just touched on implant design, but we will start with the most important one, which hopefully some of you are very excited to know what number one is. Uh, and if you're, if, you're, if you're excited to know what the most important thing is, then you're my kind of person because uh, I would have trouble sleeping tonight not knowing what number one was. And um, here is the, the flyer for our upcoming uh, course. And it is the Four Cornerstones Implant Success Masterclass. And I'll leave this slide up for just a minute because I believe the QR code is active. I tested it last night. And you can select the QR code. The dates for the course are May 10th and 11th in London. And the time is 8.30 to 15 to uh, 5.30 every day. And we will be covering the Four Cornerstones. And as Gemma mentioned early, when we first got on, we were doing hands-on experiments. And all of this will come together and allow us to do cases similar to the one I showed you earlier, but like this. So here we have a patient who has uh, tooth number two one is compromised and it's coming out. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the patient numb. We're gonna use a micro blade to just incise the gingiva, but we're not gonna elevate a flap. Then we're gonna use rotation force to remove the tooth remove the remnants, place a type four surgical guide, step through our drilling protocol, place the implant in the hole, drive it until the snap link touches the top of the master cylinder, put a healing cap in place temporarily so we can graft around it with our gap grafting. We're using mineralized cortical concellus chips. We're placing our prefabricated crown, our prefabricated crown. We're cutting off the Stanley S wings. Those are our anti-rotation wings. We're polishing it to make it look a make it look decent. We're taking it out of occlusion, covering the access hole with dense PTFE, filling the hole with some composite, and this is what they look like in about ten minutes. Uh, this patient healed so well that when he came back at the three month visit, he thought he was in his finals, and you can see the gingival discrepancy between the one one and the two one. Uh, it actually is better here in this photo than it was in the pre-op photo. And by the time he had healed, we were really within about a half a millimeter of ideal zenith height, which we were able to accomplish by changing the emergence contour of the final prosthesis so that it just blended in very, very nicely. Now, we've asked him to come back because he has uh, six anterior crowns that are very monolithic, and we would love for him to, to redo those so he can have a beautiful, sexy... Uh, aesthetic outcome, um, but he's a farmer here in town and he's not inclined to, 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 to do something like that. So once again, I hope that when you saw that video, what you're thinking in your mind is that was simple. I, I didn't see anything complicated on that at all. And, uh, and it's true because it really is simple. In fact, I tell people quite often, Many of these videos, I'm actually placing, drilling the hole or placing the implant with my left hand. And people say, well, why are you left hand? I said, no, I'm, I'm right-handed. But the reason I'm doing that is because my hand gets in the way of the videographer. And then the videographer yells at me, your hand's in the way. So I just switch hands. And because we're going through a guide, it doesn't require any dexterity. As long as I can get the drill or the implant into the guide, 
it, it goes where I want it to go and it doesn't require literally any skills whatsoever. But the effort is placed into the design up front. In fact, we have 21 design criteria on where dental implants need to go in order to ensure this kind of outcome. And we will cover that in this class coming up. But remember, the method maketh the man. It has nothing to do with me. And if you're inclined to want to learn some of these techniques, I would be happy to meet you in May in your hometown. I love this quote. It says, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. And I want to thank you for joining me tonight. And uh, if you came on a little late, I did start off by saying the slides are available. So if you send an email to info at stanleyinstitute.com and just put in the title in the subject line, UK slides, I will send you the PDF with all of the slides from tonight in case you wanted to look at any of the references. If you want to chat with me, I am on Instagram at the smile or smile engineer, and I'm on YouTube under Stanley Institute. Uh, YouTube has like five to eight minute videos covering many of the concepts that I spoke about tonight. And then Instagram has the shorter versions at about a minute or so. So I wanted to close up about quarter to the hour so that we'd have time for questions and answers. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. I will go ahead and get out of the screen sharing now. Dr. Stanley, thank you so much for the fantastic um, presentation. I think we see a lot of this type of information in snippets, whether it's in re research papers or maybe sometimes on products, um, advertising or information, but it's not very often um, that I actually see it being discussed in, in real depth. So this is a great you know, starter to an insight into this topic area. So thank you very much for um, covering this for us today. Um, I think it whets the appetite beautifully um, to learn more information about it. So hopefully we can encourage a few people to come along and, and see you in person in May. I think you've got a wealth of knowledge to share with us all. So um, thank you so much for, for starting us off with the webinar tonight. Um, oh, my pleasure. I think also you illustrated the, the key points beautifully and in a really memorable way as well. I think um, for those of us that are visual, having uh, you know the images in our mind to remember the key points is, is a real helping point as well. So thank you very much. Um, so I just want to encourage anybody, um, any of our viewers, if you have any questions, now's a great time to, uh, to ask Dr. Stanley. We have him live for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, I'll start off with a couple of the questions that have come through. Uh, this one, first one's quite an interesting one um, from a dentist called Malcolm, and he's thanked you for joining us from America, first of all. And he's he's asked, do you think British implantologists are behind the curve a little as times at times in our approach to patient-centric care? You, uh, so I would say, I don't have a clear answer for that, but I, I look forward to a dialogue, especially perhaps over coffee, when I come to visit your lovely country in May, to find out exactly how you guys approach dental implants, uh, and, or uh, let's call it tooth replacement therapy, which is a kind of a broader perspective, right? Um, I do know that there is a, a, there is a, uh, a strong trend in America that, I, that I'm helping to promote, which looks to do immediate replacement. So we have a tooth that is infected. The patient is, is it's, it's beyond repair. It would require hierodontics or it, you can't save it. And uh, the fact is, is that we can look at the digital data and we can predict whether or not we're gonna get primary stability off of the digital data. And we've published a paper on it, and I'll be covering that in the in the in the summer session as well. And so, imagine being able to look at a at a comb beam CT scan and predict primary stability. You're like, that's just amazing. How do you do that? Well, when you can do that and you have that power, you can say to the patient, uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, that tooth. I believe we can take it out, and with a high probability of certainty, we can get an implant in in one appointment. And they go, oh, that's amazing. I hate shots and I don't want to come back for a second appointment. It also shortens your overall project time. So imagine you only do one surgery and at that surgery, you do the extraction, you place the implant and say you graft around it. And now the patient's healing. Well, 
you only have to dirty the room once. You don't have to have uh, follow-up calls to have them come back for a second appointment. You don't have to dirty the room again. You don't have to do a second surgery. All, all of that costs you money and there's no added revenue from, and a revenue stream by doing it that way. So if you can consolidate it down to a short couple of minute of procedure effectively and efficiently, then that makes a very lovely solution for the patient as well as for your practice from a, from a financial perspective because you, you are going to have a higher profit margins on your cases. Now, what you do with that profit is up to you. So if you want to uh, go on vacation or holiday, then by all means do that. Or if you wanna lower your prices in the marketplace because you're so efficient to capture more market share, you could do that as well, but you are in charge. And that's one of the things we'll also cover is some of the business side of implantology when, we're, when we come to visit in May. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Stanley, just before um, I ask the next question, um, I just want to ask Declan just to check the functionality of the question box because I've got a couple of my um, contacts who are trying to enter a question and they're saying the functionality is not working. Would you mind just checking that for us, please? Of course, yes. As far as I'm aware, the live stream has been okay. So if there are any uh, cases of uh, minor cases that it hasn't been, we will follow up. But um, I know the on-demand version should be available tomorrow to play back for anyone that has been late or weren't able to watch it live. And, and, and if um, anybody watches the catch up on demand, are they able to send questions through that we might be able to help them with? um they can certainly yes i think um yeah they can do uh, regarding the live stream technical questions yes by all means send across to us they thank can do you. that yeah thank not a problem you. um no problem thank you um so i had serena um she's actually a dental nurse and she made the the observation obviously all implants might work but they definitely don't work the same um so she's She's talking from experience there. And um, Dr. Stanley, if you wouldn't mind, it'd be great if you could just summarize the real key points in terms of the features of an implant um, that a, a doctor should be looking for, you know, when selecting an implant system, that would be great. So the, the, you know, I covered that slide that has the eight key points, but here's a fun little exercise that everyone who's watching right now, you could do literally while we're, while we're here. You have access to the internet. Do a Google search for fractured dental implant. And what's interesting is that you will not see a BioHorizons implant on that search. Okay. And you go, what do you mean? And say, just do a search. You will not find a BioHorizons implant on that search. I've done it every year, multiple times for years. And it's, it's just a powerful statement. It, the implant companies themselves are, are, are not in a position to want to share their failure rates, right? It doesn't make sense for them that from a business perspective, they're gonna bury that data. So we're, we're kind of left in the dark, but we can infer based on our own self-admittance, basically doctors having a failure and putting it out there, that you can see certain implants that are, that are going to pop up on that failure when, when you type in that search, you're gonna see certain implants over and over again. You go, hey, look, this is that same implant. I see it three or four or five times. If you see an implant that's failed three, four or five times on your search, that implant has a problem, doesn't it? Because you're not seeing it with a BioRisons implant. You just don't. Now, the main reason is likely to do with the material. Being 40% stronger might just be enough that it's strong enough that it never really has a breakage problem, never really breaks. Now, that's be, just to be clear, it doesn't mean that abutments can't break. It doesn't mean that abutment screws can't loosen, those kinds of things. I'm talking about the fixture itself actually breaking. Now, some of you may be wondering, why in the world would someone choose a softer titanium metal for a dental implant versus the, why not just use the, the strong stuff? Well, titanium cannot be cast. It has to be cut. It has to be milled. And when you mill something, you have to have a tool that cuts it. Titanium is a rather strong material, right? It's strong and it's tough. So if you're using a tool to cut something that's strong and tough, 
it wears out fast, right? Well, what if you're using the same tool to cut the same shape, but you're cutting a softer metal? Well, you can cut a lot more implants that way, right? So if you're in the business of making money and you want higher profit margins, you might be inclined to use an implant metal that's 40% weaker so that you can make more implants and make more money. That's a business rationale that could be justified, right? People could say, yeah, I could see that. So people say to me all the time, why aren't everyone using the grade 23 titanium and implants? And I say, well, the vast preponderance is it's a, it's a money grab. The second thing is the industry is moving. So just this year, two more companies have changed from grade four to grade 23, uh, grade five titanium, uh, grade five titanium. And one went to one went to grade five, which is titanium alloy without the inter ELI, which is extra low interstitial. So it is not medical grade titanium. It's the titanium alloy, but they didn't take the time to, to drive the contaminants down. If you see the medical grade titanium is grade 23, it's an alloy and it has ELI behind it. And what that means is that the contaminants like oxygen and iron that are caught in the process are driven down so that the, the regions of the metal that are made out of titanium are pure. So that's very, very important distinction. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a trend in the industry. And just like I said, you don't see a lot of blade implants anymore uh, or press fit implants anymore or smooth implants or machined implants or polished implants. All of those kind of things have faded away because they had higher failure rates. Uh, we don't need somebody to send us a report that says that if those worked, they'd still be around. So they're gone. So what we're seeing is that people are moving towards a stronger metal because they don't want to have those failures. They don't want the patient having these failures. And if, if at some point there becomes a class action suit where somebody decides to come into the market and say, Hey, you, you big corporation, you were using a softer metal and, and you were having these failures and you didn't do anything about it. That'll be the end of the soft metal uh conversation conversation people will move very very quickly to medical grade titanium um i will cover every aspect of the dental implant uh from the platform from the surface technique uh that's used to the uh to the shape which is often overlooked to the flutes everything will be covered in in the may course uh and there's just so much to talk about um it would take two days to talk about yeah. <laughs> No, I know we're coming to the end of of, of the hour um, with you. I, I hope you don't mind. I've just got one more question that's come through, and then and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and we very much look forward to welcoming you to the UK. Obviously, in a few months' time. Um, so the last question I have is: What does a shearing implant design do to the bone? Ah, so the the bone is weak in shear. So the concern is, the concern is, and it is a concern, I don't have, this is just a, a biomechanical concern, I don't have any evidence, so just to be clear here, is that you're placing the interface, the bone to implant contact in shear rather than compression. And since the bone is 65% weaker in shear, it doesn't seem like a reasonable objective. It seems like if you can place that bone in compression where it's very, very strong, that you might have a longer lasting, more stable bone to implant interface. So what? how does that correlate in terms of failures? I don't know. I, I don't have any clinical data or research to support this supposition. It just makes sense to me that if I was going to choose which way I want my implant threads to go, I would choose them so that they create a compression load over time, not a shear load over time, because bone's just not healthy in shear. If you uh, jump out of a tree uh, that's a little higher than you thought and you land, your the, the ground creates an upward force, your momentum, your mass times velocity creates a downward force, it puts your lower leg in shear and you break your shin bone. So that's shear, right? So bone is weak in shear, we know that to be true. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And you you finished bang on time. So um, much appreciated. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you to um, help bring this webinar to the UK. And I genuinely can't wait to welcome you in person. Um, I'm looking forward to the masterclass in May. If anybody is um, interested in more information, you can find 
more at education.theimplanthub.com. And um, also thank you for sharing the flyer in your presentation with the QR code. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to us at Biohorizons Camlog in the UK and we'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction. Thank, thank you, you everyone for talking with you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.